All right, again, uh, what we did here for the majority of lecture A involved doing a lot of algebra. <coughs> and once again, a reminder, if you felt like you were having a hard time following, it is often hard to follow algebra. It's probably something you should watch again. You should practice on your own, do those kinds of things, you try to reinforce things. A couple of notes here. I was noticing I wrote this here. Uh, you may have wondered what that is. That's the word set. Whenever I solve algebra equations, oftentimes I'm setting one thing equal to the other. The other. This, by the way, is a sideways equal sign as well. Setting those two things equal to each other before I do my algebra work to solve for t star. That's what I was doing there, and I put this arrow indicating I was solving for t star there. Another thing that I want you to note is that we solve for the uh, prediction interval without bothering to calculate n, without bothering to calculate these things. It's okay. We can still do the algebra to solve for the circle thing as one entire quantity that was about 0 0.0256 to help us solve for the other thing. So you don't necessarily have to solve for the individual quantities themselves. Sometimes you can solve for entire chunks of things. And that's what I was doing. All right. The main focus of lecture B is going to be uh, looking at your electronic assignment, that will be your last electronic assignment for the semester. You are going to also have one more book assignment for the semester that you'll be turning in on Thursday. I did mention in lecture A that I would give you, in addition, some more problems to work on after this Thursday. These are problems you won't have to turn in. I will give you an answer key. Just more practice with this stuff leading up to the final exam to help you prep for the final. Um, a couple of your book problems involve looking at the relationship between treasury bills and inflation. What are treasury bills? They are investments essentially in the government. The government, the federal government, offers treasury bills essentially for sale. People buy them. What does that mean? That means people are giving money to the government. What they're really doing is they're loaning money to the government. It's not taxes. It's loaning money to the government. The, go the government's supposed to give them some kind of return. To the people loaning the money, it's really an investment, ideally. Interest rates for treasury bills some, this is something you should know here in recent years have been very low, okay? Considering inflation, some people even think of them as being 0% returns or even negative returns. They've been very low, not much bang for your buck as far as government investment these days, okay? The in, these, are, these are interest rates that you see here for various years. Treasury bill returns. Uh, they, they may have different maturity rate, um, time frames, like a half a year or a year or five years, meaning how long do you have to wait to get back your investment plus some interest. I'm not sure. It's not specifying exactly what the maturity time here is for these things. Um, but just go ahead and effectively think of these as interest rate returns on those treasury bills. And then you've got inflation data. What's inflation? There's two ways to think of it. People typically think of it as prices generally go up over time. Actually, the more economical, official way to think about it is that, that the value of a dollar goes down over time. You can buy less with the dollar uh, today than you could 50 years ago, okay, for example. So inflation is really the decline value of a dollar. Uh, these are inflation rates over the given years as well. These data right here are on um, a pure home problems that you'll be turning in by hand on Thursday. You'll be looking at the book's regression output from Excel, from a spreadsheet, to try to answer questions about the relationship between um, T-bill returns and inflation. <laughs> Evidently, T-bill returns, I believe, in those problems is X, and inflation is Y. I don't think it's switched around. I think it's that way, but you want to double check that. So you're trying to predict inflation rate when you know the treasury bill returns. Is it really that? Maybe you should double check that. A couple of things I should have double checked more today. Actually, it is the other way around, okay? They do inflation as X. I'm noticing here on page 541. 
and treasury bills return as Y. So they switch them around. That's something to watch out for. Okay, I'm, I'm glad I looked. They took inflation as X, treasury bill return as Y. Page 541, the regression output there shows the slope next to the word inflation. So that tells you that inflation is the explanatory variable. That's X. For your electronic assignment, we're going to look at the same data, except just a more limited year range, 2000 to 2008. I will go ahead and switch these around right now. Switch around the T bill return and the inflation rate. Inflation is supposed to be X, your explanatory variable. T bill return is supposed to be Y, your response variable. The units for both of these things would be in percent. What I'd like to do is do everything we've done with regression all at once, and this is what you're going to be doing for your electronic assignment, is doing everything I'm doing. Review it all and do some new stuff. And related, hopefully, to the confidence intervals and prediction intervals. Let's see, how much time do we have? 25 minutes, effectively, to try to get it all in. All right, so listen carefully. Think. Think with me. Don't just sit there. Think. Okay? <coughs> Let's find the typical things we find. The sum of the columns, the means, I should say sums, means, standard deviations, correlation. We'll do those things with built-in formulas. We're going to review all our formulas. Like equals sum for a sum. We're starting in row 2, it looks like, ending in row 10 here. C2 through C10. Sum of all those inflation rates is 22.59. The mean equals average. Or I could take the sum and divide by n. n here is evidently 9. 9 years, 2000 through 2008 is actually 9 full years. Oops, C is not A's. There's the mean uh, inflation rate, standard deviation equals STDEV. Make sure you're zoomed in far enough to see all these things. Copy and paste those over. <coughs> Do the correlation with equals corel. C2 through C10, comma D2 through D10. You need both columns. I did make a scatter plot for this. Um, let's see, where did I put it? Down here. Okay, it's there. I will share this file with you after I cut up after I cut out everything I do. Except I'll leave the, I'll leave the plot in there. There's the plot. Uh, hmm, I thought I put the regression equation in there before class. It seems to have disappeared. I will not bother taking the time to do that in class. I'll do it outside of class again. All right. Using the books formula, we can find the slope and intercept. Remember, our books formula for the slope is that it equals that. Let's do that. Equals the correlation, C15, times standard deviation of the Y is D14, divided by standard deviation of the X is C14. Using that formula from the book. So the slope of the regression line is about 0.7249. Intercept, that's always the same. There actually is a summation formula for the intercept, but we've always used this one. Y bar minus the slope you just found, times x bar. Zoom in on that. It's, it's equals d13 here minus c17 times c13. There's the intercept. All right, what else have we done? We will find a column for the x squareds, the y squareds, the x times y's. We'll figure out SSXX, SSYY, SSXY. Confirm the values of R and B1. Practicing these formulas. These are something you should be able to do by hand on the test, by the way, with calculator help. 
through making a table. So I, that's why it's good to practice all these things. Could come up on the final this way. So x squared, y squared, x times y. We will ultimately also do the residuals, the squared residuals, SSE. We will also get the regression output. We're going to confirm everything we've learned about. Pay attention. I see some people not paying attention. It is worth it to pay attention. I know it's hard, but it's worth it. Here, x squared, do c2 squared. Squaring the x's, squaring those inflation rates. For the y's, do equal, well actually I can copy and paste this column, cut, um, click and drag it over because the c's will change to d's. Look at one of those formulas there that you can do c to d. And now do equals x times y equals c2 times d2. Click and drag. Add up the columns. We can just click and drag this over. That's the summation row. There are those summations that are the various summations you see in these formulas. All right, quickly do SSXX, SSYY. Maybe put them right here. SSXX, SSYY, SSXY. Practice those quick as I can here. Look at the SSXX one. Some of the X squareds. Where is that? That's the uh, 68.5235. Some of the X's, that's over to the left. That's the 22.59. And is 9. So it's this minus this square, don't forget to square that, divided by 9. SSXX and SSYY are always positive. Those really are sums of squares with the definitions. This can be negative, although it's not going to be in this example. SSXX is 11.8226. SSYY, same kind of formula. This minus this squared divided by 9 again, n is 9. There is SSYY, SSXX, look at the formula. Try practicing these formulas without looking, by the way. Good idea. That summation, that's the 78.3734 minus the product of those two divided by 9. 78.3734 minus the product of this times this divided by 9. That's going to be SSXY. Confirm the correlation again. This time by this formula right here. SSXY, this one, divided by the square root of the product of SSXX and SSYY. See that? <clears throat> Compare that with this. It's hard for you to see. It's F7, F16 divided by the square root of F14 times F15. Does it match? Yes, we have a match. Those two things match. See them? 0.515 in both spots. Check the one for the slope. Just getting practice here. The slope can be calculated as that ratio, SSXY divided by SSXX. So that's this divided by this. And that will give you the same answer for the slope, the, one, the uh, 0 0.7249. There it is. So you have a match here and here. All right, what else? How about the residuals? We need the regression equation. We need the slope and intercept. B0 and B1. When you type it as a general formula, make sure you put a plus sign even if the slope happened to be negative or the intercept was negative. Put a plus sign anyway. Where the, the slope's not negative, where's the intercept? No. They're both positive, so it doesn't make a difference here. But you know, Excel is giving you outputs which could be negative, but when you type it into the formula, you should use positives. 
The intercept is in cell C18, use dollar signs. The slope is in cell C17, use dollar signs. I plug in the x values in column C without dollar signs. This is your electronic homework is to redo all this. Okay? Probably would be good for you to try to redo it without looking, but you can look at the video. These numbers should be all close to the corresponding y hats. Or excuse me, these, yeah. To the y's. Oh, excuse me, these are not the residuals, sorry. These are the y hats. Confused myself there. These y hat values should be close to the corresponding y's on average. The residuals average out to zero. Y minus y hat. Some are positive, some are negative. You should know you get a positive number if y hat is too small, y is bigger. You get a negative residual if y hat is too big. y itself is smaller, the point is below the regression line. That gives you a negative residual. The residuals do average out to zero if we did average them, though we don't bother. You see some negative, some positive. When you square them, you get a bunch of positive numbers, squared residuals. Square those residuals like this. I did equal, did you see that? I did equals I2 squared. Square those residuals. When I add up the square, squared residuals, divide by n minus 2 and take a, well, when I add up the squared residuals, what do I get? First of all, what quantity? What do we call it? S, S. E, sum of squares of errors, residuals synonymous with error. So the sum of these things, that's S, S, E. That's the thing that's minimized with least squares regression. You should know that for this final two. The slope and intercept of the regression line that you find are the unique numbers that minimize S, S, E for the given data. Any other slope and intercept, giving you other y hats and other residuals will give you a bigger SSE. Divide by n minus 2 and then take a square root, what does that give us? What's it called? Divide by n minus 2, take a square root. Anybody? Somebody must know. No? Anyone? Anyone? <sighs> Make me happy. What? It's just a plain S from chapter 10. Regression standard error. That's the plain S in chapter 10. That'll be the square root of SSE divided by n minus 2, n is 9, n minus 2 is 7, I'll just type a 7. You could type it as 9 minus 2 if you like, in parentheses. That's the regression standard error, S. All right, now we get the regression output. Not done yet. We've still got new things to do, too. I'm going to go quick, Excel minor analysis tool pack, and again, if you I did have a couple people say they weren't able to get it loaded. You, you should be able to load it by doing a search for add-ons. Get add-ons and you do a search for XL Miner. Once you're there, you can start it. It does more than regression. but well, we want regression, linear regression right there. Click the labels box first. I always do that. You should too. But then if you do click the labels box, when you highlight the appropriate cells, you should include the labels in your highlighting. So for example, the Y's, include the T-bill label there in cell D1. Highlight all those, including the label. Then go over to input Y range, click there. You could also type D1 colon D10. Then 
Then highlight the X's, including its label in C1. Click on input X range. You can also type C1 colon C2. I is a habit. Do click on the residuals and residual plots. You should too. Then finally, we want the output range to be somewhere. Where do we want the output range to be? Well, don't go over whatever's been already made. Let's put it right here, the upper left corner of the output, right there. Cell I15. That's a good spot for it. Click on output range. We're ready now. Click OK. There's the old friend, the summary output now that we're getting used to. Notice, hopefully, yes, 1.56787. Look at that right there. Standard error, that is the same as this, 1.56787. All right, good. Got a match. And is 9. Correlation is the same thing as multiple R here, though it's not if we did chapter 11. That's the same as the correlation. You remember that, 0.515? There's the squared correlation, the coefficient of determination, R squared, 0.26527. What have we done so far? We focused on the bottom, the slope, 0.7249, that should look familiar. The intercept, 1.27, those are the same numbers we've already gotten. B1 and B0, their standard errors, the corresponding T stats, the corresponding P values. For example, this P value is the P value for this two sided test. This is the most common test we've done. And the book does, that's the most common one. 7 degrees of freedom, and this T stat gives this P value. Kind of small, but not real small. Some evidence against the null, not real strong evidence against the null. If you're just itching to do regression, maybe you'd reject the null anyway. But typically, when people, at least if they've got a lot of data and the P value is not real small, they say, well, maybe regression is not worth doing. Essentially, knowing X doesn't affect Y is the idea there the population slope is zero. Here's confidence intervals, like they're 95% ones. By the way, you should be able to figure out, even though you're not given it, say a 99% confidence interval based on this information. How? Well, you know the standard error. That's given. The margin of error would be T star times the standard error for the one in this context. And the standard error is the 0.455988. If you want 99% confidence, then just look in the table for T star. N is 9, you'd use 7 degrees of freedom. You could figure out a different confidence interval. You could check that one. This interval does contain 0, which is not surprising, because at the 5% level, we are not rejecting the null. All right, new for today. ANOVA. ANOVA, that's a cool word. Uh, actually, it's an abbreviation for analysis of variance. <coughs> ANOVA stands for analysis of variance. We're going to talk about what these quantities are called right now and how to calculate them. Although it's good that Excel is calculating them for us to some degree because they can be complicated. This is more important for multiple regression, chapter 11, which we don't get to, although maybe I'll briefly mention some words about it on Thursday. You won't need to know it for the final, but I will maybe do a, a multiple regression example to illustrate how it differs. It's not essential to use this for single variable, it's one explanatory variable, simple linear regression, but I do want you to know it for the final anyway to get you some practice using it. What do we have here? I did put these quantities in the PowerPoint that I will put on Moodle for today, but for sake of time, I'm not showing you the PowerPoint. <coughs> n is 9. This evidently then is n minus 1, 8. This is n minus 2. They're both under df. In chapter 2, we've been used, in chapter 10, we've been used to using n minus 2 as the df that we use for what we've been doing so far. 
What is this df for? It's under df still. Well, it is the sum of these two, 1 plus 7. Essentially, the, num the number that's there is always the number of explanatory variables. And for simple linear regression, chapter 10, it's 1. For chapter 11, it could be 2 or 3 or 4 or 5. Or any number, actually. Any kind of number. These two do add to that one. This is the degrees of freedom that we talked about back in chapter 1 with standard deviations of data and variances of data. So this still can be considered a degrees of freedom for that. Um, this column is labeled SS. These are SS values. What SS values? This one actually is SSYY. Some of the squares of these differences. That's what that is. I'm just telling you this. We don't have that quantity uh, anywhere else, though we can figure it out if we had the standard deviation of the y's, which we actually do, so we could figure it out. Um, this thing right there, that's SSE. E again stands for error. Error is synonymous with, whoops, that's a mistake, sorry. This thing is SSE. E stands for error. Error is synonymous with residual. This thing is what the book and I am calling a sum of squares with respect to regression, or SSR for short. Think of that R as going with regression. Error is synonymous with residual. So the E goes with residual, the R goes with regression. You can check with your calculator that if you add these two numbers, SSR and SSE, 6.21268 and 17.2075, you do get 23.4202. These two numbers do add to that number. This is called mean square. MS stands for mean square. And the basic idea is you're averaging these numbers with respect to the degrees of freedom. This one is the same as that one. The idea being you take this one divided by 1 to get that one. This one is not the same as that one, but you divide this by 7 to get that. Try it in your calculator right now. <coughs> take 17.20715, and divide by 7. And you should get about 2.48582. This is SSE divided by n minus 2. This really is the same as SSR divided by 1. So it's SSR in chapter 10. Chapter 11, it's SSR divided by something else, like 2 or 3 or 4, whatever the number of explanatory variables is. This thing is called an F statistic. What is it equal to? It's equal to the first MS divided by the second MS. MS for regression, which you might denote like this, MS reg, divided by MS for the residual, MS res. 6.21268 divided by 2.4582. You can try that. You should get about 2.5273. Turns out this also equals the T statistic squared uh, for the slope. Can't see it here. I'm going to move down, but then I'll move back up. The t-statistic for the slope is that 1.589752. You might want to write that down, or maybe I will. T for the slope is 1.58975. It turns out that f also equals t squared. You can check that with your calculator. You take 1.58975 squared, and you should get about 2.527. You should know all these things, crazy as it may seem. I want you to get used to what's going on in here, what are all the relationships. What's this thing? Don't put things away here, important things to say. Significance. Hmm. That's a, that's a p-value, actually. What p-value? It's a p-value in chapter 10 for this test. We've seen that test before. I wrote it on the board, in fact. We've seen this p-value before. 
It's off the screen. Here is the p-value for this test, the slope. That p-value matches the other p-value, which you can't see down here, in chapter 10. It would not in chapter 11. It's a different test in chapter 11. You know, I'm going fast here. Can you hang with me still? One more thing to say, which I will really focus on a lot in lecture A next time. It turns out that r squared, this is the last and perhaps the most important thing to say, the square of the correlation, the coefficient of determination, equals SSR 6.2261268 divided by 23.420. SSR divided by SSYY. And that is perhaps the most important equation of what I'm trying to say in all this. In this electronic assignment, you don't need, not need to make all these comments, of course. You just need to do everything that I did. Okay, and label things well.